Uh, it took us about 15 minutes uh, to come up with eye cakes, and we chose cakes because it features quite large in our team, it's a way of keeping ourselves sane, etc. And therefore, we thought we'd share some muffins with you, some mini muffins. So, what is commissioning? What's the definition? This is um, a definition that um, government have come up with, and it's basically making the best use of all available resources pro to produce the best outcomes for our locality. So it sort of links the amount of resources we've got, both money and people and intelligence and everything else, to look at getting the best outcomes for an area. There's another definition which is sort of more health-focused, um, that talks about the planning and purchasing of NHS services to meet the needs, the health needs of a local population. So certainly from a clinical conditioning point of view, that one is around meeting the needs of our population. And if you Google commissioning cycle or NHS commissioning, and Google Images, which is exactly what I did. This is um, the diagram that comes up most often. So if I just take you through it, um, it might sort of help you get your head around the whole thing. So the first thing is around strategic planning. So it all sounds quite dry, but this is about what is the need? What do people in Bristol or South Gloucestershire or North Somerset or wherever, what are their health needs? What are their social care needs? So we, we take that sort of information from the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment, so we take it from some quite formal data sources. But we also take it from sort of informal sources. So I don't think necessarily any of our formal documents would have told us about the health needs of girls and women who had um, female genital mutilation, for example. So that came from communities telling us what their health needs were. So there's a sort of formal data research stuff, but there's also lots of informal stuff that um, gets played into that. We also look at what we currently do in terms of service provision. I think the NHS has sort of grown up really, and some of it was planned and some of it's just become custom and practice, and, and we don't often have the time or space to stop and think, well, is this the best way of doing it? Is there a different way? What's research telling us? What's the money telling us that we can't afford to do anymore? So we do look at sort of also reviewing our service provision, and examples of that are, um, you know, from a blunt point of view, we sometimes centralise services into one hospital trust rather than having them delivered by two hospital trusts because that's deemed to be um, a way of delivering far better outcomes for a population. Um, and the trickiest thing, I think, in a lot of this is deciding our priorities. So you heard David talk earlier about the Sustainability and Transformation Plan. Um, uh, and the way that we need to think about, well, what is it we're going to do? I'll talk a little bit later about how we prioritise, but I think that's, from my perspective, is one of the hardest things to do because everybody's thing is important and actually everyone's health condition is important, and, but we can't do everything at the same time. So that's the sort of planning-y bit, strategic planning. And then once you've decided what your priorities are, we need to do some design work. So we need to design our services. And increasingly, we want to do that with people rather than doing it for people. But that's at really early stages. So um, we take into account lots of information. We try not to do things the way we've always done them. But again, that's really, really difficult because we've been doing that for a long time. So there's a number of things we do. Sometimes it's about mapping pathways, something sometimes we have to think completely differently about how we design something. And we also have to be careful about designing services that would suit people like me, who work in the health services as a manager, as opposed to people who aren't like me. So you have to make extra effort to think, well, that would suit me as a sort of middle class person living in Redland, but I don't know if that's actually going to work for somebody who's homeless or somebody. So we're trying to sort of get better at taking that into account. Um, shaping the, this one says shaping the structure of supply, which sounds again very, very formal, but traditionally we have a number of suppliers of healthcare services. We've got GPs, we've got hospitals, we've got adult social care people, um, but again increasingly we are looking at who else has a role to play. So is that around um, the voluntary sector? How much do citizens have a role to play actually in providing their own health care needs? Um, so there's a there's um, a sort of element of, of, again, not looking traditionally at hospitals, doctors, clinicians, who else is around, including citizens, to do some of that work. Um, and then we have to sort of do the technical stuff about capacity and demand. 
So how many people are we expecting to go through a service? Um, how many people are we prepared to pay to go through that service? It's a really difficult one, and I think there are bigger brains than me that can do that sort of work, but it's really important. So once we've procured a service, um, and sometimes we buy it from existing providers, so it's unlikely that we would go out to a tender for A&E services. You know, there's some stuff that is bog standard, but where it's something very new, then we may choose to go out competitively. So we may choose to go down that whole sort of tendering route, but we might choose not to. We might choose to use the best placed person that already exists. So there are decisions to be made about how we do that. Um, so once we've procured it, we then have to monitor it to see that it's working and evaluate it. And again, this has always been part of the um, commissioning cycle, but it's the bit that we haven't always been fantastic at. Um, so we'll quite often start something off and breathe a huge sigh of relief because we've got through the what's the need, designing it, the pain of getting everyone to agree, et cetera, et cetera. And then we sort of breathe such a huge sigh of relief that we then move on to the next thing because that's the next priority that's come up. So again, increasing, we're trying really hard to say at this stage, okay, we're designing something, how are we going to evaluate that and making sure that we collect enough information when the service is being implemented to be able to say in a year's time, well, actually it is or it isn't having the effect that we wanted it to have. Does that sort of make sense? I think it makes sense, but I think it's a bit dry. So, and, and it's quite complicated, and I always try to simplify complicated things into stuff that's in my life. So this bit's a bit odd, but when I try and explain commissioning to my friends in the pub, when they sort of say, what is it you actually do every day? Um, I think about this. So this is not a great photo, but it's my old kitchen. So I had a kitchen, and uh, if I think about it in commissioning terms, I, uh, I had to assess my need. So and I need a kitchen. I had a kitchen. It was fine. I could cook in it. Uh, but as with the NHS, we're always trying to make things better. So the NHS is there. It does a great job. But we, I'm quite proud of the fact that we're constantly trying to improve it. You know, we're, we're blessed in this country to have what we have. Um, but it's not quite good enough for us. So we're always wanting to make improvements. So with my kitchen, it was a functional kitchen. Um, but um, in reviewing the service provision, I realized that I didn't like what I saw. Uh, it didn't look good. It actually had had a number of leaks. There's a, a cupboard up here where a squirrel had got into and died. <laughs> so uh, I, was, I was quickly falling out of my love with my kitchen. Don't ask how it got in, but it, it did, and it wasn't very pleasant. Um, I also, um, I'm only five foot three, and I had to constantly bring a chair into the kitchen to get to this cupboard and the stuff that was at the back. Uh, so it just, it, you know, it wasn't fit for purpose. Um, and so I decided on my priorities, you know, I run a household, was my priority to go on holiday somewhere really nice for two weeks or did I want to prioritise my kitchen? I decided to, that year to prioritise my kitchen. So I then had to design it. You know, I had to procure it, so I had to design it. So what did I do? I got lots of really flashy, glamorous magazines, as a lot of people do. I spent a lot of time in WH Smith's, just sort of browsing. I talked to everyone and I, I just took public apologise to my team. I work in an open plan office and I, whilst working, clearly, I was asking for views. What did you do in your kitchen? Who did you use? Etc. So gathering views. Um, I talked to a kitchen designer. I had to be really clear about my outcomes. Uh, so for me, budget was quite key, I thought at the beginning. Uh, so uh, I uh, talked to a kitchen designer um, and sort of talked about my ideas, talked about the outcomes I wanted. I wanted it to look good. I wanted to be able to reach everything. I wanted to make better use of the space, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, And then I had to think about the structure of supply. So I could have asked them to do everything and subcontract, which is you know one way of, or I could um, decide that I wanted them to design it but get other people in. But is this something familiar for anyone who's done any sort of housework? So. Um, so I had to have lots of discussions. Uh, they came up with a solution that was outside of my budget, but looked amazing. Uh, but I had to be quite strict and say, no, I can't afford that cupboard. And blah, blah. So there were lots of compromises along the way, and that's often what commissioning feels like. There's a gold standard that you really, really want, but you have finite resources. Um, so I did a lot of that, a lot of decision making, and 
God, what's my clicker? What I finally got was this. Ooh, I think I bit want more of it. Ooh. Um, so, oh my God, it looked amazing. But in terms of monitoring and evaluation, uh, this got fitted, the gas hob, and after a week it stopped working. Uh, so again, I had to sort of go back to supply, but it was fine, it got sorted. There's a sink on this side, and I live in a flat with uh, downstairs below me, and when I came back really excited one day, partway through the build and turned my new tap on for ages, I then got a knock on my door from my downstairs neighbor saying uh, water was leaking into their flat. So, uh, you know, things go wrong, um, and you have to sort of negotiate how they get fixed. So in my head, commissioning is no different to deciding that you've got a need, trying to work it out what is you need, what you want the world to look like, um, securing those services, and then monitoring and working out how it goes. So uh, that's how I explain it to my mates in the pub, and it just makes it more interesting than that commissioning cycle diagram that we all use in our presentations. So I talked earlier about the fact that prioritising from my point of view, is the hardest thing. And it's the hardest thing because I think people who work in the health service want to do the best for everybody. Um, so we will, you know, there's a sort of, um, we get approached by all sorts of people who have certain health conditions. And commission is a human, so we do have a response that says, oh my God, I really do want to help people with X or with Y, and there's so much we could do, but we are really restrained both with people and money. So certainly for Bristol, um, we have about 120 staff, but not many of them, we oddly, um, are actually doing the technical commissioning bit. So there's all sorts of other things that commissioning organisations have to do and are responsible for, like safeguarding, which isn't strictly around commissioning, but we do have only a limited number of people to do the work. I, I, I'm, constant, I'm often saying to people, it's great that you've got this idea, but somebody actually has to do it. And um, one of my favourite kids' stories was The Elves and the Shoemaker. I don't know if anyone remembers the Ladybird book. Um, and the shoemakers would go to bed and the elves would come out and do their work and then disappear. Uh, we don't have any elves. <laughs> when we leave, nobody's coming in to do the work. So um, part of my job is to sort of say, OK, that's great, but who is going to do that to make sure that it gets delivered? Um, there's a bit of a tension between must-dos and local decisions. So we do have a... Um, we are told um, that we have to do stuff nationally. So you must, you know, NHS England, Department of Health say, you must invest X amount of money in this service because that's what we've told the public we're going to do, which can sort of sometimes aligns with what we want to do and sometimes doesn't quite align, but um, that's what we um, are quite, quite often have to battle with. Um, and the hits are really, really interesting because they work really hard on service changes but ultimately somebody has to pay for that service change in, in a lot of cases. And quite often that person is the commissioners, which is why when David was talking about alignment, that's why it's so key, because you can work your socks off to come up with a brilliant service that's evidence informed, um, but somebody has to pay for that. And therefore commissioners ha have to make a decision about, well, if we invest in that, what are we not going to invest in? Because we only have a finite pot. So that's why it's really um, important. And even when your perhaps hospital says, yes, yes, we want to do that, quite often the manager will then come to commissioners to say, well, we've got this new development and actually somebody has to pay for it. So even if they're saying yes to you as a clinician, quite often the next step is that they're coming to us to say, can you pay for that? Which is why it's so crucial that everything's aligned. Because if you're working on something that's one of our priorities, we will then work our, you know, our hardest to make sure that that gets implemented. Um, I talked about the finite pot. And, and it sounds quite hard, but if it's not a priority, it's unlikely to happen. And it's not because we don't care, it's just that it's not a priority. And I feel quite awful sometimes when people sort of say, well, can you come and join our hit? We need a commissioner on the hit. And actually, because it's not a priority and we've got an, a finite amount of time, we can't say yes. Um, so I think I'm just emphasizing the fact that commissioners aren't ignoring you. And, and I think Becca will talk a bit about emails and stuff, but um, it's really, it's, it's just really difficult. Um, in terms of the framework we use to prioritize things, I think this is really interesting. So certainly in Bristol, and I don't know about the other two CCGs, we've got um, a prioritization framework, which is supposed to be an explicit um, use of some of these things to think about, but I think it's sometimes done implicitly in somebody's head. So the stuff that's mandatory, which is just a 
we've got to do this, we've got no choice. But the other things we think about is, does it align to what the national thinking is? You know, um, is there a push towards more self-care? And therefore, although we haven't been told directly we have to do it, is, is that the way that the wind's blowing? There's clearly the local alignment. So what are people telling us? What are our needs? And does it fit in with some of that? And then we also obviously think about outcomes. What is the outcome? What, what is this new intervention going to do? Does it fit with the outcomes that we're looking for? You know, what's the clinical benefit? Scale's really important. Clinical commissioning groups are responsible for the health of a population. And that's how we have to make some of our decisions. So um, there's a thing about the scale of the impact. Is this going to impact on five people over the next five years? Or is this going to have an impact on 80% of the population in the next five years? So that's, I'm not saying it's a yes, no, but it is something that we take into account when we're making decisions and prioritizing. Um, as commissioners, we do have legal responsibilities around reducing health inequalities. So. Um, that is something that we haven't been brilliant at taking into account of um, in the past, but I think increasingly we have to. Um, what is the evidence for effectiveness? I'm talking to a bunch of researchers. So uh, that is uh, a really interesting one because quite often for commissioners, I think there are different standards in terms of what you would accept as evidence and what we would. And again, Becca will talk about that in, in, in her bit. Um, but also the transferability bit. So what ha often happens is it worked over here, and I don't know if researchers find this as frustrating as we do. So it worked over here, so therefore we can do it over here, and, and sometimes it's a bit contextual perhaps. So is it going to work in Bristol when it worked in Cornwall? That sort of thing we sort of want to take into account. How easy is it to implement? You know, is this a really quick and dirty, actually this is, this is barn door obvious, it's not going to be a lot of work, it's an easy thing to do, or are we going to have to get the agreement of you know, the, the hundreds of people who work in healthcare in Bristol to implement this, is it, you know, do you need to buy lots of equipment, et cetera, so there's a, a, a bit of that. And um, I think we also have responsibilities around um, sustainability in terms of energy and, and green. So is it something that will reduce car journeys? Is it something that will mean that people's time efficiency, is it a low energy thing? So I, I would suggest at the moment in health and social care, this is less of a consideration. But so, and, um, and at the moment, this is less consideration, although it should be a higher one. But th that's just to give you a sort of flavor of what we think about. Um, and obviously, there's the um, as David um, spoke about, there is the money issue. So I thought I'd also give you a flavour of the sorts of documents we need to fill in to get stuff changed. So, and it's quite a busy slide, but this is um, what I've done is taken, and uh, uh, the other CCGs will have something very similar, but these are the headings from our business cases, and I've got two slides of these. So the sorts of things that when even if your hit's the best hit in the world and you talk to a commissioner and they want to implement it, they will still have to convince their own organisation to say yes. So the commissioners that you have on your hit still have to go through our internal processes to get a yes or no on a decision. And, um, and this is the sort of stuff they have to complete. It's not in any particular order, but we do have to talk about the evidence base. So we in Bristol are asked, what evidence have you used? If there isn't any evidence, tell me where you've looked. So this is a sort of a, a, a new thing. Um, we have to talk about quite clearly about the benefits, both financial and non-financial. Um, we have to talk about, you know, I talked earlier about we're not that great at evaluation, so we're trying to get people to think about how they're going to evaluate stuff. We have a legal obligation to involve patients and the public, so we ask a question around how have you involved patients and the public. Um, are there any other implications or impact on partners? And, and uh, that's something we've also missed a trick on in the past. So we've said, oh my God, if you do this in this context, it'd be brilliant. And then somebody else in the system, it's usually primary care, will say, that is brilliant. However, what you're doing is increasing my workload over here. Or the council will say, well, actually, we're already doing something. So we try to get people to think about what they're doing and the knock-on effect of that around the system, which, again, in the past, we haven't been brilliant at, but we're getting better at that. 
Um, and also to think about, are there any downsides to what we're doing? Because we're in our enthusiasm to improve stuff, we sometimes don't pay enough attention to actually, is there going to be any adverse impact anywhere else in the system on that? And, and there's more. Um, so again, s uh, increasingly we're being asked, but what else did you think about to solve that problem? So you've come, up, you've come to me with one solution. What were the other possible solutions that you discounted? So again, that's quite new, um, but it's something that we're sort of saying, you need to further justify why, you've, why you think this is the right answer to the problem. There is a big section on savings. And, and I find this bit really interesting in terms of how CCGs and commissioning's learning. So what often happens in my experience is that the saving is through a saved outpatient appointment. So if we do something in this way, it means that people don't have to come into the hospital and we've saved an outpatient appointment. And as commissioners, we've all traditionally gone, that's brilliant, we've saved sort of 200 quid for each time. But what we are starting to realise in terms of cash, that we've saved, that doesn't always happen because unless you close the clinic or reduce that capacity, we've got so much demand that it just gets filled up and we therefore continue to pay. So what we end up with is a great intervention which we might have to pay a little bit more, it might be less than an outpatient. But because of demand, we're filling, uh, we're filling those um, clinic slots with people that we still have to pay for. So in terms of the cash that's released to a commissioner, it doesn't always materialise. There are other huge benefits, like better patient care, better safety, etc. But I think we're learning in terms of the cash benefit, we have to be quite careful about relying on a saved outpatient appointment because that appointment gets filled. It's not to say that we would never invest in something that had that effect because actually demand is so high that hospitals need to release the capacity to see people are coming through, but it's just be careful about what we say is a cash saving. Um, this is the bit about the elves. Do you need any additional resources to, to deliver what it is you want to deliver? Um, and if your scheme doesn't work, is there a plan B? Is, uh, um, is something that we are also asked. So that's sort of the technicalities of commissioning. Um, and I guess the question is, well, who does that job? And you know, you've got me standing here, I'm from a C I'm from Bristol Clinical Commissioning Group. Um, but there are a number of commissioners in the system. So um, this is a nice King's Fund diagram, and I'd recommend that you go onto King's Fund website. They're really good at explaining stuff, <laughs> I find, and have quite good diagrams. So what we've got here is um, the Department of Health who say, this is how we want the health service to be. They give us a mandate. And then you've got NHS England uh, who um, produce commissioning guidance. So the latest guide, we sort of get a, a Christmas gift from them. Every December, they send us something that says, this is your planning guidance for the next year. These are your must-dos. This is what we want you to cover. And then you can do some stuff locally. So they have that role, but they also commission primary care and specialist services. So in terms of GPs, optometrists, dentists, that's what they are responsible for commissioning. And then at the other end, the highly specialised stuff, they are also responsible for commissioning. Clinical commissioning groups um, are responsible for commissioning the rest of hospital services, this is quite generic, mental health services and community services. So thinking about things like district nurses, community physiotherapy, etc. So that's what we're responsible for commissioning. But, and local authority are responsible for commissioning public health interventions, so smoking cessation, um, screening, um, immunisation, etc. So there are three commissioners, and depending on where in a health pathway or health condition pathway you're talking about, you may not need to talk to me, you may need to talk to someone else. Um, and it's complicated by the fact that we're all responsible for different bits of the pathway. So if I think about a, a sort of linear clinical pathway, if we start at prevention, and the, what somebody was talking about the wider determinants earlier, well, that's all done by public health. And then, um, so if I think about something like um, weight management, so um, public health will be giving messages about um, being active, healthy eating, etc. And then if somebody does become um, more of weight, they may access a service that's commissioned by public health. If they have, uh, if they gain more weight, they may be accessing a service that's commissioned by 
the clinical commissioning group. And if they get to the bariatric surgery stage, they are then being, that service is commissioned by NHS England. So you can see how it's very difficult. And, and whilst we try to talk to each other, it doesn't always happen, English shaking her head vigorously. Um, so, uh, and on top of that, what's increasingly happening is NHS England are responsible for this and this, are increasingly sort of encouraging and telling clinical commissioning groups that they are then going to be responsible for doing this. And sometimes we're going to be fully responsible, but sometimes they want us to do it together with them. And increasingly, local authorities and clinical mission groups have some joint commissioning arrangements. So it's really hard to um, say, well, you know, I'm doing some work on weight management and which commissioner do I need to speak to? Well, which bit of weight management are you talking about? Because that will depend on who you need to talk to. Does that sort of make sense? Um, obviously, we take advice from NICE, and that's why that's um, over here, because they give expert advice to all the commissioners. But that just sort of gives you a flavour of the technical bits of commissioning. I'm just going to pause there in case we've got a bit of time for questions at the end, but is there anything that didn't make sense? Ooh, great. I'm going to pass over to Becca. I'm Becca Robinson and I am um, work with ADWA in Bristol Clinical Commissioning Group and I've been privileged enough to be part of the knowledge mobilisation team for the last two years, which I've been a NHS management fellow based at the University of Bristol in the Centre for Academic Primary Care. And these are some of my colleagues that I've been working with. Um, it's been a half-time secondment, so I've kept a foot in the Bristol Clinical Commissioning Group and I've had a foot at the university. Um, and I've worked with other NHS management fellows and researchers as well. And we've been uh, supported by Leslie Y. So it's been a really interesting time. And one of the things that we found is together how different the organisations are. So the two Helens have been based in Bristol Clinical Commissioning Group with different steering groups. Uh, Helen with Urgent Care, Helen Baxter and Helen Kramer with Long Term Conditions. Um, and James and I have been up at the university linked with um, research teams. Uh, and Sean is from Avon Primary Care Research Collaborative and she's been involved with, uh, she's Head of Evidence. And Rachel and Jude were the previous year, so they were part one of the scheme, and myself and James and the two Helens have been part two. So together, we've, we've noticed all kinds of really interesting things, and I just wanted to share a little bit of some of the differences that we've sort of observed through our journey um, as part of the knowledge mobilization team. So some of the things that um, we've sort of identified is how different commissioners and research uh, review different aspects. And evidence is really interesting because as a commissioner, we define evidence as a range of things. So we talk about academic literature, we talk about local intelligence, we look at benchmarking, we talk to colleagues, we look at case studies from other areas. Um, but when you talk to your research colleagues, actually, they define evidence as academic research. So we talk about quite different things. And when we're showing what's out there as part of our business cases, as Ad Adwa says, sometimes there isn't any relevant evidence. And we find that quite frustrating. Whereas when we talk to our research colleagues, they get quite excited about the fact that there isn't any evidence because for them there's an opportunity to potentially do something new and something different. So it's quite interesting just the different takes from the different organisations and those of us that work within it, um, how that works. And I think the other thing from a research perspective is you tend to focus clearly on defined questions that, that are sort of fairly narrow to enable you to do a rigorous study. And one of the professors said to me, it's really interesting, Becca, you commissioners look at the bit of research we've done and you say, that's great. Can I use it over here with this group of people in this population, tweak it slightly because it doesn't quite fit with what we want and will it still give us the outcomes that you've demonstrated work. And he says it just doesn't work like that. <laughs> and I think that's really interesting. We're often looking at trying to have that sort of transferability and, and using it in a different context. And actually, you can't guarantee that that's, that's the case. But that's always, as commissioners, what we are wanting. A bit of that, that sounds great. But we want to do it over here and a bit differently. So it can be quite frustrating, I think, for our uh, academic colleagues. One of the other things is language. And, and I found certainly 
the language. I came to the university two, nearly two years ago, and I felt like I'd moved to a foreign country. I sat in meetings. I had not a clue what was being discussed at all. And I spent my whole time writing down the things, the odd acronyms that were said, so that I could go and Google them after the meeting to try and understand what had been discussed. And I know my research colleagues find exactly the same when they're in the commissioning world as well. So I think, you know, language is really interesting. It takes quite a long time to sort of understand each other and talk a language that works across the organizations. Um, and the other thing that is frustrating for all of us, and I know the research is particularly around the initiatives that are introduced in commissioning world regularly. Um, I was thinking earlier, sitting here, I was at this um, conference last year, no mention of the um, sustainability and transformation plan, you know, something completely new, but hopefully will help us to work in a more collaborative way but you know hadn't been heard of this time last year so it's really interesting all the different things that come in and the impact that that has I think from a commissioner's perspective, we like evidence which is relevant and easy to understand. So we want you to say to us uh, in three bullet points what the outcome of your research was so that we can go away and use it. It um, doesn't really work like that, and I, and I appreciate that. But that's sort of what we want. We want plain English. We want something. We don't want to read the academic paper. We're not quite sure what the P equals what is. We just want to know, is there evidence that it works or not? It, what, you know, what's your findings? Um, and timings, you know, that's another thing that can be quite frustrating. We need evidence quickly. We have to sort of write papers or business cases. We might have a couple of weeks to do that. Um, and I know for you, the lifestyle of, uh, sorry, the life cycle of, um, of research doesn't work in that time scale. So I know, you know, there's tensions around timing when we're looking at these things. And communication, back to I think what Adwa referred to earlier, emails. Um, if you're a commissioner, you don't necessarily get round to replying to your email, not because you're not interested, but just you get drowned in emails. Um, and so it's not that you're not interested, whereas talking to some of my research colleagues, they were saying if they don't reply to an email, it's probably because they're not interested in what you're asking them. So I think there's some real fundamental differences in terms of how we work. Um, so the, the commissioners get lots of emails. They will get round to them. It might be a few weeks before they do. Um, whereas, as I say, the researchers will tend to respond to things that they're interested in. Often for commissioners, it's quite a good idea to try and contact them by phone. However, they do tend to be in quite a lot of meetings, but um, most of them will have answer phones, and people often will respond better you know, if it is important. The sort of sense is, well, someone will chase me. If they really want me, they'll come back to me. Um, so it is on my list of things to do, but I perhaps can't get to it yet. Um, but obviously, researchers tend to be out and about. They might work different hours. They might work from home more, whereas Commissioners are generally around office hours and, and sort of more office-based. So we quite like verbal exchange, whereas uh, the sense is that the researchers prefer written documentation. <laughs> it might be a little bit of a generalisation. Um, let me just look at my notes. I think I had some other things I wanted to say. Yeah, so one really good example about the emails and the, the contact, I was talking to a colleague, researcher at the university, who's desperate to try and get in touch with a particular commissioner. Um, and I've put them in touch previously and done a sort of introduction. And my commissioning colleague did respond, said, yes, she'd really like to meet with this researcher to discuss something. Anyway, the researcher contacted me again this week and said, you know, you put me in touch. That was sort of three or four weeks ago. And um, I've not heard back. Can you maybe nudge her, help, find out? Is there someone else I need to speak to? So so um, I managed to track down my um, commissioning colleague yesterday and she said, oh, God, it's on my to-do list. She said, I absolutely, it's really key. I really want to speak to her. Um, and I said, well, can I get someone else to put a date in your diary for you? You know, have you got a PA? And she hasn't, but she's given me the name of someone who can help. So I've gone back to my research colleague saying, she's really apologetic. She definitely wants to speak to you. She can catch up with you in July. This month's a nightmare. And this is the name of uh, the PA that can, can help you. So I think it's, you know, it isn't that they're not interested not interested, it's just that the tensions of, of workload um, do make it quite difficult. So that was just a sort of example of where I've had that happen uh, recently. So just some information and top tips, so just a, a few things to, to sort of be aware of. I mean, I think the NHS landscape is really complicated. Um, there's 211 commissioning, clinical commissioning groups in England, and all of them are structured differently. So, you know, I know how Bristol works, and we've got a long-term conditions lead, and we've got a, you know, urgent care lead. Other 
commissioning groups don't necessarily organise themselves in that way. So it is really difficult. So I would say phone a friend, use whoever you know, whatever contacts you've got, use them to help you find who it is that you need to speak to. Um, and I think generally people are really happy to do that, to try and put you in touch with the right person. And I think as Adua um, explained, you know, who you need to talk to, it might not be a commissioner in that organisation, but those colleagues, contacts, friends will help you to sort of navigate your way to the right person, but it isn't easy. <laughs> um, but we are very happy to help. I think the other thing is we don't have commissioners for every condition, every health condition. So often you might be interested in one particular aspect and there may not be a commissioner um, for that. But we tend to have areas of, of individuals, clinical leads, uh, commissioning managers who cover certain areas. So there may be a small working group working on something specific that we can link you in with. Um, but there isn't necessarily a commissioner. And I know Inga, who's here in the, in the audience, she's our uh, maternity and children's commissioner. And there's quite a lot of different hits and things that are covering topics that influence on that and people also to say oh we need to speak to a commissioner I'll go that's Inga <laughs> so it's often one person who covers a range of things and it's quite difficult then to split their time to support all the things they want to get involved with um, I think also really interesting research have a wealth of knowledge from a commissioner's perspective and an example of that which I think sometimes people don't always appreciate what they have to offer I was asked to go and meet with one of the researchers who wanted to do some sort of key messages for uh, commissioners and I sat with her and, and she talked about the research she'd done and some of the the beginnings of evidence that they were finding and more research that they wanted to do and I was really keen for her to actually put that down so that it was something that we could share. And she was really nervous of doing that. And she said, but it's, you know, I can't honestly say that it's absolutely certain. And you know, we need to do more, more um, research to find out if that's the case. So really, I wouldn't feel confident to do that. And I was sort of saying to her, you know, every day we're commissioning services with no evidence, with, with nothing that supports the, it feels like the right thing to do. And sometimes if there isn't evidence out there, you have to go with what your colleagues and others and specialists believe is the right thing to do. So from a, from a commissioning perspective, if you've done um, research on a certain subject and it, it's an area of interest for you, you will have a wealth of experience which is so valuable to us. Even if it's a conversation about the reading you've done, the understanding you have around the subject, what evidence is out there, you know, don't underestimate what you have to offer because it is enormous and it's really, really valuable to us. And I think sometimes people don't always appreciate that. They tend to say more research is required required and that's not a helpful recommendation for us we really are interested in in the knowledge and expertise that you have um, and I think what's in it for a commissioner goes back to the previous one you know you have so much information that you can share think about that when you're approaching commissioners you know what can you share with us uh, in, in in return for sort of the support we can give you you know is there a win-win for both really um, and I definitely think that's the case and we've had some great examples where Avon Primary Care Research Collaborative run uh, seminars that they hold in South Plaza and and sometimes I think in Canning Hall um, and we had one of the researchers came and spoke about um, rationing of healthcare, which was something she'd been involved with I think as part of her PhD and she had a wealth of experience which was really really useful and interesting for us so you know don't underestimate what you have to offer and, and sort of think about that and then I think the final ones really just being aware of the tension of time you know the, the time frames work quite differently and a good example of that was I was talking to one of my research colleagues um, earlier in the week saying we decided we had to in true hip fashion come up with an acronym for the name of our seminar today and it took us 15 minutes to come up with eye cakes we sat there and whatever and she went 15 minutes should it takes us weeks to come up with things that we want to name our hits and other things she said that's no time at all so I think you know it's interesting just in terms of time that research takes the the time we have to turn around business cases in commissioning the the, the time frames are very different and I think we need to be sensitive to that in each other's worlds and, and see how we can work together um, to to optimize the opportunities really so I think it's over to you if any you've got any questions for us that's what we wanted to share with you I don't know whether you, whether you need to, whether it's loud enough or whether we need microphones. Thank you. Rebecca, thank you for that interesting um, comparison between a researcher and a commissioner. As a clinician, I sort of in the middle between the researcher and a commissioner. We work like commissioners. We want to deliver things quickly, but we are also interested in evidence to a certain extent. 
one of the things we do as clinicians is we sort of express an interest, say for example, um, the point you're talking about email and how uh, researchers would like to respond very quickly, whereas commissioners are interested but don't have the time. Um, as clinician, we say yes and no straight away. Yes, we would like to be involved, but we don't have time this month. Um, at least the other party is interested in a way to say that, yes, we got some interest, we can work on this. Sometimes it's frustrating to say that we don't even get that acknowledgement um, from the commissioning world to say, yes, we are interested in, in your project, but we don't have time this month, next month, but we'll come back to you in two, three months' time. Mm -hmm. So how do you think as, as commissioners, how we can handle that? Good question. <laughs> I mean, I think the HITS is a really a good opportunity of bringing organisations together. And I think that was one of the things from my own observations. I used to work clinically uh, in the Cute Trust. And I, and I think, you know, often there are clinicians who, who want to work with academics to make things happen. And I think in the past, there's been a lot of collaboration between those two. Um, sort of organisations and less with the commissioning world. And I think the HITS is a fantastic opportunity of really looking to bring those those three and other partners together in a much more sort of structured way. So I think, you know, hopefully that is a step in the right direction. And I think also sitting here this morning, hearing some of the conversations that were happening, I think higher up strategically, there's much more um, collaboration going on. And I think that helps all of us lower down the organisations to, to enable that to happen as well. I don't know if you've got anything you wanted to add. I think that's right. I think increasingly, as David was saying, it will be a bit of a barn door because what people are coming to us will be what commissioners and the rest of the system is interested in. From a sort of human point of view, um, sometimes people approach us and we know, and this is very uh, probably personal to me, but I know the answer is going to be no, we're not interested. And it's quite hard to say no. So sometimes there is a bit of... Um, I wouldn't say delaying tactic, but you need to be able to be able to articulate why you are going to say no, because we can't say yes to everything. So if I'm approached by somebody and it's very niche and it's very interesting, but I know it's nowhere near our list of priorities, it's actually very difficult to have a conversation with somebody that says, I'm, I'm really sorry, but no, you're not going to get any support from us. In the, as, even if I'm saying it now, I'm feeling a bit oh, tense about it. But, you know, I'm really sorry, but you're not going to get it. Um, we're unfortunately able to, unable to give you any support for that. So, but I think there's a. I think it comes down to quite a basic thing of it's impolite. I guess is what you know. It's it's frustrating for you not even to get a. I've got your email. I, I will get back to you. Yeah. So I, I I think we just need to take that on board. Can continue to invest our time and resources yeah. into this or no? Otherwise, there's a lot of wasted energy. Yeah. Which sort of uh, pulls you down, and you don't have the energy to keep going and hitting those. Um, so that's, that's the main frustration as a, as a hit lead we have uh, within the projects we are undertaking yeah. in, in terms of getting an acknowledgement to say, yes, uh, we have received your email. We can't look at this now, but yes, maybe in six months' time, we don't even get that acknowledgement, which can be frustrating. Yeah. The second question I had was in terms of aligning your CCG priorities with other CCGs, as, as a specialist service, we sort of cover six or seven CCGs. We uh, approach one CCG, they say yes and then we approach the other CCG, we don't get any response. So how do you align at that level to say yes? Um, obviously, we, need, we cater to population covering various CCGs. We can't keep knocking seven doors and wait for two years for a project to get, get started. So what are your views on, views on that? Yeah, I think um, that's the challenge of having the system that we have. Um, you're going to hear a lot about sustainability and transformation plans today, but Essentially, each CCG is responsible for commissioning for its um, its location and its, popula its population. And traditionally, each CCG has had its own set of priorities. And traditionally, each CCG has wanted to do things its own way. Increasingly, we're being told that's not going to work. Um, and the challenge we're being given now is if we've got an idea in Bristol, we should automatically be thinking it should be Bristol, North Somerset, South Gloucestershire. So I think in the past what's happened is Bristol have had an idea or South Gloss have had an idea or North Somerset have had an idea and then they've approached the other two and they haven't necessarily wanted to play. We are being told that's not good enough. And actually what we need to be thinking all the time, unless there's really good reason, is how is this going to work across Bristol, North Somerset and South Gloucestershire. So I think the, pla the, STP, plan that we're, the STP that we're talking about will increasingly mean that people start thinking in that way and have quite difficult conversations with colleagues and other CCGs that say, 
you know, it's sort of all for one or, or not. And, I, and so I, I haven't got an answer, and especially when you're talking about a specialist service where it's not just Bristol, North Somerset and South Gloucestershire, but you're talking about Somerset and Gloucestershire and perhaps even further um, southwest, where they're not in our footprint and we have very little sway over how they want to um, commission and services. So I don't have an answer, but I think locally, over the next few years, that conversation should be easier and you'll find that the CCG should be saying similar things, whereas in the past it's been very individual, which is partly why the sustainability transformation plans have come into play, I think. Hello, I'm Paul from APCRC, the R&D team in the CCGs. And just a point um, back to you on uh, contacting with commissioners. So I work for the R&D team for three CCGs, and I think a facilitated uh, contact through the R&D team is probably the best way to get acknowledgement immediately. Then we can work in trying to get kind of a friendly in phase, and then it's easier for commissioners who don't have the time to say no, and then we can facilitate the, the response back, and I think that would really help. Um, but my other question was, a lot of the research that we work on has health economic um, analysis looking for savings if we invest heavily now, this year, 5, 10, 20 years time. There's massive savings to be had. Is that possible in the commissioning cycle that we actually work in? Is that useful evidence? Oh God, this is such a frustrating one. So intellectually, I know that if we invest this, now we will be saving ourselves an absolute fortune in 10 years time and actually it's not just me that knows that our chief finance officers know that everyone in the system knows that it's bond or obvious and then what you get is um actually this year we have to save we we have to save x million pounds and certainly in bristol and it's probably similar in the other two we've got to save x million pounds we've identified how we're probably ish going to save three quarters of that but in Bristol, we're left with £11 million worth of savings we have to find in one year. So you have these real... I mean, I'm working a lot on diabetes at the moment, and we know if we invest in um, self-care, prevention, etc., at this end, we will save an absolute fortune at that end. And everyone knows that. And then you get told by um, NHS England, who are being told, to be fair, by Department of Health, what about your financial savings in year? And so it's... Uh, it's as frustrating to us, uh, is my thing, it's as frustrating to us as it is to you that we can talk about health economics and everyone knows that's the conversation we should be having. And it's probably the conversation we would have been having had we not been in, in the financial situation we are in. But there's a real, you know, even the chief finance officers, uh, I know, I know, I have to just, I have to explain how we're going to balance the books in 1617 because politically, X, Y, Z. So, uh, it's not answering the question, but we're no, as no, frustrated. No, it's helpful. It's, but, um, so possibly the Department of Health is where we should be yeah. focusing a lot of our evidence of those you know, investments now to save later, and we need to be talking to the policy makers yeah. there and the finance officer, yeah. whoever that is. Can I just say, that's not to say we won't invest to save, and yeah. I think there is work certainly around diabetes that's going on currently, which won't have in-year savings, but it'll have benefits for patients and longer-term benefits. So we do certainly look at those, but we are compromised to a certain extent by what the purse is, what's in the purse, yeah. I think it's over here it's to Marion. It's a big question. Uh, um, so, in practical sense, those com those decisions get made by governing bodies. So, you know, the hard, what are we going to do, what aren't we going to do? A proposal will go to decision makers, governing bodies, um, and they will make decisions on that. 
I think there's, for me personally, there's a much wider question around, you know, I explained how I have to explain to my mates in the pub what the hell commissioning is. They had no idea about the fact that there is a set of money that we pay for services and that the money won't fund everything. So, and that everyone has different needs. So I think there needs to be a much wider discussion with the people who live in Bristol, North Somerset and South Gloucester to explain that. I think lots of people don't understand that the NHS is the same as your household budget. There's lots of nice things I would love in my house, but I can't afford it. So I think, yes, we can make those hard decisions and the governing bodies do and the SDP will increasingly need to. And one of the other things is we're really keen to do is what should we stop doing? What isn't adding value? What isn't evidence-based? And we know it's not evidence-based. And what is causing harm? And how do we engage and talk to people about making a shared decision about what health they want and what health they don't want. So I completely take your point. We are talking about, but use the word rationing in a public arena and everyone knows what happens. It's all oh, they've stopped funding this. We're not, you know, we've been told to think the unthinkable and, and some of that unthinkable, we know, you know, we have to sort of go, is it worth the battle? Is it not? So it's something that, you know, nationally, everyone's grappling with, and I don't have an answer, but you're, you're absolutely right. But I, I personally think this is something that we should be having a big conversation in Bristol about with people who live in Bristol to say, it's your NHS, this is your cash we're talking about. How, how do you want to spend it? Do you understand that we can't have a Ferrari service because actually we don't we only have enough money for a Ford Mondeo, I, you know? Uh, can I, I ask a quick question about tendering? So are you, you said you have a choice about putting things out for tender. Are you not experiencing pressure to put um, any sort of service out for public tendering? And my second part is, when you consider your kitchen analogy, if you just put the little project of your kitchen out there, you could go for one provider. But if you take into account that if you get a certain provider, they will also sort out the problem in your bathroom and something yeah. else. And if you don't give them the project, then they may not, your bathroom might fall apart because that little extra bit of service. So how can you kind of make those decisions where projects link in? So the, the tendering thing is, um, oh God, the whole procurement thing is a bit of a, what is the law, what isn't the law, what are you allowed to put out? It's very political. We've got campaign groups telling us to put stuff out. We've got campaign groups telling us not to put stuff out. So I think those decisions and that framework is sort of up in the air, if you like. Um, and you're right about, are you missing an opportunity? Because actually, if you get somebody to support you in a certain service, there are knock-on effects. So, uh, as Becca said, it's really complicated. <laughs> um, commissioning, you know, my kitchen analogy is the way that I try and, if I think about how big space is, it does my head in. So, if I think about how complicated commissioning is, it does my head in, and I have to sort of bring it back to a very simple thing. But those are all really valid questions that are the reality of commissioning. Um, don't have the answer, but that it just what we wanted to do in the workshop was just explain the simple end. You know, in theory, it's a simple process, but some of the complications and the difficulties and the political, you know, the politics around it. Yeah, uh, this gentleman's been waiting. Have we got time for one very quick, or we too yeah, long? one more. Yeah, come on then, and then it's uh, time for questioning. Coffee. I just. Uh, wanted to say that's one of the best uh, talks about commissioning that I've heard and that um, it was done in a sort of compassionate and engaging way for researchers I think and, I th and that's really important so it's really really nice to hear that and some great analogies. Um, I, I agree sort of with what David was saying and what you've been saying about the future being evidence-based commission uh, decommissioning uh, and I wondered whether there was any way of... So in my simple clinician mind, I say every time you want to do something extra within our finite budget for this team, you've got to tell me two things you're going to stop doing because you know they're a waste of time, and then you can do that one extra thing, and in that way, I'll st hopefully stop everyone going off sick and manage the waiting list. So do you think there's any way that you could... Um, I appreciate the political difficulties with evidence-based decommissioning, but do you think there's any way, I uh, noticed that you've changed your business process, any way that you could get something in in that way? I'd, I would, I'd love to. <laughs> um, I, and I, I don't see why we couldn't. And I, th I think there is um, an increasing sort of movement, especially amongst uh, clinicians, around too much medicine. Um, and, and I, I know some of the GPs I work with are really keen to do some, to get a groundswell of movement 
up around too much medicine and that whole thing I've got about actually talking. People in Bristol aren't thick. If we talk to them and explain stuff, and if you explain that if you have this intervention, well, that might be all right, but you might not be able to do the gardening because you can't bend your knees in the way that you used to. Yeah, I don't think people know that. They just sort of think, oh, there's a magic bullet and I'll have this operation and it will make everything better. But we need to have conversations with clinicians. We need to have conversations with the public about that and the impact that some of those decisions make. So I would love to be able to sort of do more of that work. I think it's far more interesting than some of the other bits that I do. And I think it'll have a bigger impact. Um, so yeah, I, I would welcome to having a chat with you about how we can do some of that. Yeah, I think we need to stop. There's people waiting to come for their coffee. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed for your engagement and your time. Many thanks.